Andreas, thank you very much for inviting me to this. And yeah, I'm going to talk about some approaches to adaptive machine learning for time varying systems. And a quick outline of the talk is a little motivation about why we care about uncertain and time varying systems. And then I'm going to give some quick background on some adaptive model independent feedbacks for time varying systems. And then I'll get into how we combine that with machine learning to actually do adaptive machine learning. And I just wanted to quickly show people what, what Los Alamos looks like. So this is the, we're up in the mountains. We're in New Mexico. Everyone thinks we're in the desert, but we're actually up at a few thousand meters. So this is the town on one of these mesas and then the, there's deep canyons in between. And then the lab is here next to the town. And there's the Lance Linear Particle Accelerators where I work is down here. And here's just a view of Lance. We accelerate um, ions <clears throat> and, and part of the motivation actually is Lance, which I'll show you. So I think a lot of you know this, but some of the tuning challenges for accelerators is that the, not only are the machines very large and there's many parameters that are coupled together, you know, hundreds of magnets, RF sources, and they sort of change and drift with time, but also the beams themselves change and drift with time. And so, for example, here's just a laser image spot from an FEL cathode, and over time it changed. So without anyone really doing anything, right, maybe the quantum efficiency of the cathode changes, maybe the laser, something about it changes. Well, that completely changes your initial bunch distribution, you know, your 6D phase space of your beam coming into your accelerator. And also, bunches themselves are, are pretty complicated. They're not just nice spheres or ellipsoids. Maybe the central core sort of looks like that, but you know, you get these clouds, these halos. At Lance, especially, this is just simulation data, but of our longitudinal phase space. But we have these tails and filamentation of the phase space because we're a very space charge dominated beam. At the very end of our machine, we're only at 800 MeV with protons or H minus ions. So we're always suffering from space charge forces. And even at free electron lasers, where the electrons are, I, I think of it as instantly relativistic, even at 5 MeV, you know, you have such intense bunches that once you start to compress them, the fact that they're not perfectly uniform, you get these nice little micro bunch instabilities that look very pretty, but they they complicate your dynamics. So this is actually data from the European XFL. So all of that makes it difficult, you know, to predict things. Even if you have the perfect model, sometimes you can't even have the right initial conditions to stick into it. And so for example, at Lance, here's again, just some simulations of the beam going down part of our accelerator. This is what we look at to tune actually. What the operators look at is loss monitors. So you just get some you know, bumps, how much beam is hitting walls of the accelerator. We do have some beam position monitors and we're upgrading them for a long time. They weren't functioning. And here's just some current monitor readings over a 12 hour time period where supposedly nobody touched anything. You know, This isn't special to Lance, I just wanted to, motivate a little by showing you how noisy and how things are kind of just drifting around with time. And so, of course, these same difficulties are faced by other machines, such as LCLS, LCLS2, there's the European XFEL, there's the Swiss FEL. You know, all of these machines are trying to do very fancy things where you make very short bunches of electrons, very intense. And I think it's even more difficult for these machines, for, for new machines like free electron lasers, where you have many different experiments that want their, everyone gets their own uh, electron beam energy or, or bunch length, or you know how much charge is in the bunch. And you have to very quickly switch between them. So now in, even like at Lance, for example, if it takes us a week or two just to tune up the machine and then it's slowly drifting around, well, you have to retune it very quickly all the time at a free electron laser for every different experiment. And so at Lance, even we were thinking about one of our goals for a while has been to build a free electron laser, this Marie accelerator that's parallel to Lance. And some of the things we wanted to do with that was within a 200 microsecond RF pulse, you know, accelerate up to 30 custom spaced electron bunches that are, you know, anywhere from a few nanoseconds to tens of microseconds apart. They can all have different charge per bunch and you can look at dynamic events with that. And so this is actually from LCLS, but this is what, you know, all of the end stations that I would say at all FELs or even at all light sources sort of look like. It's a lot of different experiments and everybody wants their own, maybe you want softer x-rays and FEL for biolo biology type studies. 
Maybe you want harder x-rays for coherent imaging, especially if you're going through metals. And if you're looking maybe on really short pulses for looking at really fast events like pump probe, looking at shock waves. And you know, there's some things that are very difficult to do. For example, at LCLS at some point, you know, they have this low charge mode where if you really want a very short bunch, you actually have to lower the amount of charge in your beam so that the space charge forces don't tear it apart. And you have to retune parts of the accelerator. And so to help with that, you know, there's lots of machine learning tools and there's adaptive feedback tools. And I think they each have their own strengths, you know, for machine learning, you can use lots of big data and you can learn very complex input and output relationships of systems directly from the raw data, right? And you can learn these relationships in a global way so that you can have global tuning and find global optimums. You can do anomaly detection, you can do a lot of things with this. And then on the other side, there's adaptive feedback, which it doesn't try to know about your system. It doesn't try to sort of memorize some representation from the data. What it does is it quickly responds in real time based on feedback, based on measurements. And with that, it's very useful, I think, for things like virtual diagnostics and real time feedback and local tuning, where you can really in real time respond to things that are not modeled and to disturbances. And Whereas this, I think of as a kind of uh, maybe slower, but more global approach. This is a faster, but local approach and this can get stuck, for example, local minimum. And um, I think combining them is important. So my background is adaptive feedback. So when I first you know, started looking at machine learning in neural networks, my immediate instinct was, okay, how can we use neural networks maybe in a global way and then kind of zoom in locally using adaptive feedback and how can we connect them and connect them even in deeper ways than that, which I'll show later in the talk. So first I'm gonna just give a quick background on this model independent feedback and a little motivation for it. So, so my approach to this started actually, you know, in graduate school, I was thinking about how to control unstable and time varying systems where you don't know the dynamics. So this is just a scalar kind of toy problem where you have some dynamic system and these are the dynamics of the system, F of X comma T. And you also have some control input to your system represented by you, but maybe you don't know this function G that multiplies your control input. And it can vary with time actually become positive or negative. And this was actually a, sort of an open problem. If this function is unknown and it's allowed to pass through zero. So sometimes you completely lose control. Sometimes in the most simplistic sense, you could think sometimes it's positive, sometimes it's negative. So you don't know we, even which way you're pushing or pulling the system. You, you definitely can't use any kind of just uh, proportional integral feedback. And even adaptive schemes that existed couldn't handle this. They, they had to, they could handle uncertainty in these, but they, it, they wouldn't allow this to change sign or to pass through zero. And so the approach was you could actually take something, uh, a Lyapunov function and use that inside of your feedback to guarantee stability of the system. And, I'll just go through this very quickly. I know a lot of people here probably don't have control background. You might not be interested in the Oppenheim functions, but just as a quick uh, background, if you have a nonlinear system, dynamic system, it turns out the only way to prove stability about it is either solve it analytically, and then you you can prove if it's stable or not. But that's very hard. In very few special cases of nonlinear dynamics, so you can solve them analytically, or there's this Lyapunov technique where you can come up with a function which is positive definite. It has some bounds. And if you can prove things about its derivative with respect to the dynamics of your system. So if you can prove that, for example, this energy like function is always decreasing, then you can prove stability about your system. And intuitively, you could think of it as, a, you know, if you have a mass spring damper, for example, and you just look at the total kinetic energy. Well, if there's some friction or damping, it's eventually going to stop moving. It's going to run out of energy. So if you look at its total energy, kinetic plus potential over time, they're eventually going to decay because they're being lost to friction. And so these Lyapunov functions are sort of a generalization of that. There's this abstract idea of a sort of an energy function for your system that you can use to prove stability of your system. And the basic idea about this feedback was that you could take your unknown time varying system and by using this actually simple looking dynamics, on average, your system looks like this, where the, the most important part is that this input multiplying your controller, which you don't know, in the average sense, if you go through the mathematics, it becomes squared. So it becomes positive semi-definite. So now you sort of know which direction you're pushing in. 
And this function that you chose, which could be something like a Lyapunov function, you actually do a gradient descent of that function. So if you pick something like x squared, your system on average starts minimizing x squared, which, you know, if you drive x squared to zero, that means x goes to zero, that means you've stabilized your system. And so, you know, this has been extended now to not just where you choose a system, it turn, turns out you can even just, you just have some function that you're measuring, but you don't know what it is. It's some unknown output of your system. And you can put that into that same feedback and you still, for this unknown system, which may be very complicated and changing with time, you end up minimizing this analytically unknown output function, which is actually corrupted with noise even. And those are just scalar examples. You know, this works for vector valued system where you have linear time varying system, nonlinear time varying systems. And again, like I said, with unknown output functions that are corrupted by noise, where these are all matrices now, but again, they become positive semi-definite and you can, you can minimize these unknown functions of unknown time varying systems. So for things like accelerators, why do we care about this? Because, you know, accelerators, you can think of them as these large dynamic systems. They have many physical parameters represented by X here, which you might care about, which might be, you know, the RMS beam size at some parts of your accelerator. And then there's also parameters that you control, like the currents of the magnets. And a lot of times we have very limited diagnostics. And the only thing we could see is maybe how much current do we have in some part of the accelerator or how much beam loss, you know? And so that's a perfect type of function that's time varying and unknown. And you want to minimize it with respect to all of these parameters. And it somehow depends on all these measurements, which you can't really do in real time, non-invasively, not easily. So you can minimize this type of function. So the, I'm not going to at all go through the math of how to prove analytically the convergence of this system, but we did prove it. And the basic intuition behind it is you take all of your many parameters that are coupled in your dynamics, and by adjusting them at different frequencies, you actually make them orthogonal in Hilbert space. So their, their inner products go to zero as your frequency goes up. And you end up minimizing these analytically unknown functions by doing that. So we, we've applied this in a few places. I'll just really quickly, just to show you what we've used for just this before I connect it to machine learning. We've at, at Spear 3, for example, we took a group of magnets where you kick the beam in and out of the ring. And if they're not all tuned very nicely, then you get Betatron oscillations and you couple between the horizontal and vertical. So we purposely took this third kicker magnet <clears throat> and we moved its voltage plus or minus 6%. And if we didn't do anything else, you could see that the, this cost function would go up and down as we move left and right, as we move that magnet. And what this cost function is, it's basically you look at a beam position monitor and you look at your X and Y position over 256 turns and you just count the, you calculate the variance. Okay, so if your beam was directly on center and there were no beta tron oscillations or smaller beta tron oscillations like this well-tuned beam with the red X and Y here, then your variance will be very small, right? And if you're not tuned and your beam is actually oscillating a lot, you get a large variance. And you could actually see, you know, you start with this variance in the X direction, your beam is oscillating, the beta translations, and then it actually couples into the Y direction. And so we actually had other kicker magnets that had to make up for this magnet moving in the X direction. We also had skew quads that would try to take out the coupling between the X and Y components. And so we, we actually were tuning eight parameters simultaneously. They were the magnetic field strengths and the pulse lengths of these magnets. And we could see when we turned on the feedback, you know, it you could see it by these blue dots here, but for the same variation of that third kicker magnet, you had much less variation of the of the, you had much smaller beta tron oscillations because in real time the system was adjusting all of these other magnets to try to cancel that out. And this was just like a proof of principle demonstration where of course this magnet doesn't just move by itself that much, but this was a nice demonstration in a controlled environment with an accelerator that you can change things very quickly and adaptively make up for them. We've also applied this at LCLS. You know, we've tuned parameters up to six, we're here we're tuning six parameters of the LINAC to maximize the X-ray energy coming out of the FEL, which is a nice example too, because it's a stochastic process. So it's very noisy and you could see we were still increasing it by adjusting all these parameters simultaneously. And that was the, you know, the increase. And, and actually at European XFEL, we also got a chance to apply this method where 
Here's an example where in four minutes, we more than, sorry, in four minutes, we more than doubled the average pulse energy coming out. In this case, we were tuning four magnets in undulator sections. And we even, just to show that it wouldn't get lost, we, we didn't do this final study here long enough to see what would happen, but we ran it with uh, 125 parameters, which were many magnets in different sections of the undulator and started slowly increasing the average pulse energy coming out. So you can handle many parameters simultaneously and for time varying things. And at Los Alamos, we've recently demonstrated it for tuning based just on beam loss measurements, right? Because that, those measurements are the easiest to get. They're kind of in real time and they give you very little information. They're kind of tough to just look at beam loss and know exactly how to adjust the accelerator. So in this example, we're adjusting six components, which are the amplitude and phase of modules two, three, and four of our drift tube Linux. And what we were looking at was losses, a few different losses actually downstream from them. And actually, this was nice, like this example, it was in the middle of the night, we had a beam development time and I was setting up the algorithm, experimenting with it. And then we we're about to leave and we had a nice um, power glitch where suddenly it was a lightning strike or something. We have a lot of old equipment. We have things that don't quite come back exactly the same as when they left. So things flashed on and off, some of the you know, components in our accelerator, and suddenly all the beam losses came back much higher. And the operators just from their experience knew that usually the first things they adjust are the amplitudes and phases of these three modules, because these are this one is pretty steady and the accelerator is very sort of sensitive to these. And that's why we, our beam development was actually focused on these also. So the operators asked us, hey, can you try to lower our beam loss by adjusting these parameters? which you could imagine for an operator to do it by hand, they would do one at a time, then go back and forth between them iteratively. I don't know, it might take half an hour, it might take an hour. So we turned on the adaptive feedback and this is what it's doing to all those six parameters. And you could see that basically within 50 steps, it made large changes to them and now they're kind of settled around new places and the beam loss dropped. And so this was pretty much within five minutes, you know, that it was able to, tune up these six parameters to lower the beam loss. And then if you leave it on, it would maybe slowly follow the drifts in the system. But you can see the beam loss is now kind of staying steady. And the beam loss was actually a combination of different weights of those, of the Linac losses, switch yard losses, and losses in our proton storage ring. And so now we've applied it not just there, but in our proton storage ring, we've tuned up to 20, 10 vertical and 10 horizontal steering magnets to lower the ring loss. We've used it in our weapons neutron research part to tune combinations of quadrupoles and steering magnets. And we actually have a GUI that's running up now in our control room where the beam physicist, if they want to tune a certain section of the accelerator, they just pick a, whatever parameters they want. They define whatever measurements they want and add them with different weights as their cost functions. And then they run this online feedback and it adjusts the parameters and tries to minimize whatever losses they want to look at. And um, at Awake, at CERN, we recently used this to do multi-objective optimization online. So the idea here was, you know, they wanted to, at the interaction region where their electrons and protons should overlap, they wanted to have a very small spot size. And so they were tuning uh, two solenoid magnets and three quadrupole magnets to just theoretically adjust, you know, the longitudinal, I'm sorry, the transverse beam size. But because of coupling and other things in their machine, actually by adjusting these magnets, you actually changed the trajectory. So they found their beam was going off target. So what we did was actually we set up two simultaneous adaptive feedbacks. One of them looked at 10 steering magnets and we showed that we could adjust these 10 steering magnets to get the beam to follow a prescribed trajectory. It could, this is shown just in 30 steps, it's adjusting these 10 parameters to get the beam to follow the desired trajectory. And then we ran a second loop, a second, a, we, so, sorry, so we turned this on, it's running all the time now, right? It's very quickly adjusting steering magnets to always try to keep the beam on its desired trajectory. Then at a much slower time scale, we adjust these five parameters, the, the quadrupoles and the solenoids, who, which do affect the trajectory of the beam. And so you could see here, this is solenoid one, solenoid two, quadrupole one, two, and three. We're slowly adjusting them. Much faster, we're readjusting all the other 10 magnets downstream to keep the beam centered. And we're doing this simultaneously. And you know, be, and with this method, we were able to both keep the beam on the screen centered at the interaction region 
and we can get the spot size smaller than they could before. Okay, and we've also used it for sort of non-invasive diagnostics where I'm gonna skip over this uh, pretty quickly actually, but basically at FACET, you had the real accelerator and you had an online model that only gives you an estimate of the beam dynamics. It wasn't actually matching. And we, what we wanted to do was predict the TCAP measurement, but this is a destructive measurement where you physically you know, smash the beam into the detector and what we did have, which was a non-invasive measurement, was you could pass the beam around a, a dipole, you, the beam dis disperses in terms of energy in the X direction, then it goes through a half kind of wiggler, and the natural synchrotron radiation that comes off gives you an energy spread spectrum, which is a rich enough measurement that it gives you some you know, unique da data about your beam. So the idea was we adaptively tuned the model online that was running, to get the energy spectrum of the model to match the measured energy spread spectrum. And once they matched, we could actually predict what the bunch length looked like. So these are actual TCAV measurements when it was running. And these were the, our predictions of that same TCAV while we we're changing the beam coming into the machine and changing accelerator parameters that we could track it in real time as a non-invasive diagnostic. And you know, we we're just running the TCAV to make sure we we're getting the right answers. Really, we were just looking at the SCX spectrums. Okay. So for one, one other just final example, I want to talk a little bit about reinforcement learning and optimal control. You know, coming from a controls background, I have just this, I think of reinforcement learning as sort of optimal adaptive control with uncertainties. Because, you know, if you look at Bellman's results from even the 50s and dynamic programming, if you take a dynamic system and you have some cost function associated with it, some, and you can look at a finite difference approximation of it, then you come up with these policies that how do you maximize, minimize your cost, maximize your reward, you know, minimize your penalty, whatever you want to call it. And, and there's this dynamic programming approach to do it, but you have to know your system exactly. And it turns out if you replace your approximation of the system dynamics or even the cost function with convolutional neural networks and call that deep Q learning, then you can have some very powerful results that can find optimal controllers for systems that you don't even know. They're unknown systems and you find these optimal controllers. And I just like to point out that, you know, the language has changed. So in, in control theory, we might call a system like this, if it's stochastic, you know, maybe it's a Markov chain with decision process. And we have state space, which is X, the state of our system. There's feedback control, which is the feedback we put in, et cetera, optimal adaptive control, you know, with uncertainties. And then in reinforcement learning, um, at least this stayed the same, but people like instead of state space to talk about agents instead of feedback control, they call it policies, but you know, I think of it as a very similar thing. So one approach to this with, with dynamic feedback is if you have some unknown system, maybe with even an unknown function and the system is repeatable, so you can learn something about it iteratively. So for example, at our accelerator, we accelerate at, 120 hertz, we repeatedly accelerate the same bunch over and over and over again. So if you know everything about your system, on the left here, I'm just showing you the recipe for the optimal linear feedback controller for even a time varying system to follow as prescribed trajectory. If you know everything about your system, exactly the cost function, the trajectory you wanna follow, the dynamics, you can build the exact global optimal feedback controller given by this. Okay, it itself is a differential equation you have to solve in terms of everything you know about your system. Now, another approach you could take, which is, um, this is not this deep Q learning, this is an adaptive approach to it, but instead of trying to learn all this in neural network, what we did was we said, okay, we're gonna parametrize our controller as a combination of basis functions over this given interval of time from zero to capital T. For example, we can just use, you can use any basis functions, but you can think of a Fourier series, right? You can build any function out of Fourier, out of sines and cosines. That's it. So here, now you just have to find the coefficients of your basis functions to build your optimal feedback controller. And you can do that iteratively. And for some simple examples, we show that we reproduce, you know, the, the actual optimal trajectory and the optimal feedback, which otherwise you'd have to analytically know everything about your system. You could do it for you know, not continuous systems, for noisy systems. You can, if they're changing with time now, you can keep updating these parameters and keep relearning the new optimal. And the, the main result I want to show here was you can even have, you can learn the actual optimal feedback matrix. It's a time varying matrix, which guarantees that you have an optimal feedback no matter what your initial conditions are. 
So what we did was we started a system with two different sets of initial conditions. And we iteratively ran it over and over again until we learned directly from this data without knowing anything about the system, right? We learned this optimal feedback time varying matrix. And then for a brand new set of initial conditions, which it had never seen, it reproduces the optimal trajectories. You could see the, the dashed are the optimal trajectories you'd have if you knew everything about your system. And the solid lines are the trajectories we get. And here I'm just showing you the how it's learning. And here I'm showing you that this is, we learned the actual time varying optimal feedback matrix in this case, where the dashed lines are what that matrix looks like if you analytically solve it, if you know everything by your system. And the solid lines are these, this optimal matrix we learned, which is parametrized by a Fourier basis series. And we, for an accelerator, just pointing out that it was interesting to do that because for example, if you think about IQ space and RF control, you have things like in your local oscillator or just cable length changes or amplifiers, things drift and your initial conditions actually change with time. And this can keep relearning, this can stay optimal, sorry, because it's actually learned optimal feedback. It's not trying to learn some kind of feed forward about your system. It actually knows for no matter what your initial conditions are, what is the optimal response? Okay, so now to get to machine learning, sorry for all that feedback control stuff. So for time varying systems, one thing of course you can do, I think the most natural thing to try to do is you can try to just retrain your neural networks, right? You can take new data and you can retrain any kind of machine learning process. And I would say that works really well for slowly time varying systems. And, but I think it's still, it's difficult if you really need large data sets. So typically any kind of project I've been part of where we do machine learning on a machine, unless you're really lucky, like at LCLS, where at the end you have a TCAV and you can look at that all the time after the undulator and look at, you get some really nice data all the time, basically non-invasively. Usually it's tough to get enough data. You know, you need some dedicated beam development time maybe just to get data about your system. And also it's usually it's difficult to acquire lots of new data without interrupting operations. But if you can, you know, there's some interesting approaches where you can do retraining and domain transfer where basically, Here's just a nice example where they were doing mapping diffraction patterns to the orientations of the crystals that they came from. They started and did everything with simulation using hundreds of thousands of simulated data sets. Then they just took a few thousand real measured data sets and they could use UNETs and even just retrain certain layers of their network and just retrain the network to then perform really well on experimental data. And I think this type of approach is very powerful, but it's kind of hard to do at most accelerators if you really need invasive measurements. So finally, for you know, how do we combine adaptive machine learning and time varying systems? So the, the main idea is kind of shown here. So this is sorry, this is just one of the approaches. This is the simplest approach, I would say. So maybe you have some desired beam properties that you want to get. You have some kind of learned machine learning approach, right? That maps your desired properties to parameters of your system, okay? So for this might be a neural network, Gaussian process, you know, maybe it's the neural network inside of reinforcement learning. So it's like deep Q learning. So you take data simulation, real data, right? You, you teach some kind of machine learning process that you tell it, for example, I want these beam envelopes or these trajectories or this beam size. And it tells you, okay, here's exactly how you should set your machine to do that. And the idea is you don't just trust that, right? You actually go out, look at your accelerator settings Sorry, you set those settings and you take a measurement and you look at, okay, well, how well did I actually do? You look at some error and then you do an adaptive update and you can just update. So this isn't actually updating your, your actual machine learning structure in a time varying way. It's just doing iterative updates based on some measurement. And in some ways, I guess you could say reinforcement learning does this, right? Because you, you do... You try to learn some things about your system and then you take measurements and maybe you don't try to do it in one shot, right? You take, you look at your error and you try to make adjustments. And so I, I would say this is sort of the simplest way to do, to help add something adaptive to your machine learning approach. And so we did this at, at LCLS. We, um, I, we used their TCAV, so I just like to show so a graphic, you know, you take your beam, the TCAV, deflects it, then it spreads, you use a dipole to spread in terms of energy, then you splat it into a detector. And then here's some nice images you actually get of your longitudinal phase space and time versus energy. You can look at their projections. And so the idea was, 
we wanted to train a neural network to be able to, I wanted to give it longitudinal face space images and, and have it learn how to set the machine to give that desired longitudinal face space. And then I knew that, you know, if this is not gonna actually work, it'll, it'll give you an approximation, but the machine is changing, the initial beam is changing, things are drifting. Maybe it'll just give you a global, optim, uh, global estimate. It'll kind of give you this high level view of how to do it. And then locally, you actually look at, well, what does your beam actually look like now that you set it? And iteratively do feedback with a model independent adaptive feedback to really zoom in on and get what the beam you want. And so first we proved that just using the model independent adaptive feedback, we could get the face spaces we want, but we did it when not starting too far away from the desired face spaces and parameter space. And then we learned this, we taught a neural network to map face spaces, modular face space to parameter settings. And then finally what we did was we started with two very different beams, very far in parameter space. And we wanted, so we wanted the blue longitudinal face space here with its projection, the current profile here and the energy profile here. And if you just did the adaptive feedback, it was very slow because we started so far away in parameter space. If you just had the neural network give you an initial guess, it brought you, it didn't actually give you a much better answer than the adaptive feedback, but it brought you to a di completely different place in parameter space, which was, which was actually the right neighborhood to be in. And then finally, adaptive feedback from using the starting point could zoom in and focus and get you where you want. Okay. So, but then we're thinking about, okay, how can we add actually more flexibility into these neural networks, not just take their outputs and slightly change them. So the idea here is, you know, you can add more flexibility into your machine learning by adding inputs that you maybe you don't even know these inputs, but you just want to have that flexibility. So, the example I'm going to show you here is a simulation example of we want a virtual diagnostic for the bunch for the beam at, at Lance, for example. We want to see what the envelope of the beam looks like, the size. And we know really well, you know, what the magnet settings are. So there's 22 quadrupole magnets, and we can set them. And we can build a surrogate model that we just tell it some magnet settings and it tells us the beam, the profiles. But in this case, I also want, I knew that, you know, our initial beam might change. So I want the added flexibility where I teach the model. When I actually teach it, I make a huge data set where I, I keep changing the magnet settings, right? But I also keep changing the initial RMS beam size coming into the accelerator. And I train this neural network to then predict your beam profiles based on not just the magnet settings, but also on the initial beam size. Now, the problem is we can't actually measure the initial beam size in our accelerator in real time, but that's okay. We just want to have the flexibility for the network to be able to handle that variation because then what we do is we, we get our virtual diagnostic. It predicts for a given set of settings what the beam looks like. And then we just look at the beam at the very end. At the very end of this section, we look at just the beam sizes and, and we can get rough estimates of that because we just have apertures and things that just based on the beam loss, it's proportional to the beam size, right? So we compare these predictions to the measurements and, and then we iteratively update our guesses of what the initial beam size must have been to give us that match. And so here's the setup. It's a, in this uh, simulation, it's 22 quadrupole magnets. And we're just doing this in this case with these kopchinsky vladimir approximations of the beam envelopes train the surrogate model, which is now a surrogate model, which is not like the typical approach might be to stick in these parameters, right? This has this added flexibility that you could feed back into. And the surrogate model does really well. You could see X and Y are predicted almost perfectly in this example with, and the beam size is predicted and there's some outliers, but overall it does pretty well. And then what you could do is change the initial beam size with time and using this adaptive feedback, this surrogate model is now adaptively being adjusted to keep tracking those initial beam sizes. And that results in it actually tracking the envelopes of the beam throughout the machine now, even though it doesn't know what the actual initial beam size is, but the adaptive feedback is adding that information in there by tuning it. And you could see the difference of this loss function, you know, without it and with it, you're, you keep minimizing by tracking the correct beam size. Okay. So, uh, and I think now the next step is, I think what the most interesting approach is, which really, at, you know, it combines them in a deeper level, I would say, machine learning, 
and model and feedback where the main idea is you want to tune the latent space itself. Okay, so the examples I'll show you are focused on these kind of generative uh, networks, which are like an encoder decoder, for example, where you a convolutional neural networks, you put in some image, this, you know, this is a very large dimensional space, an image, say 100 by 100 image, that's uh, 10,000 dimensions, right? <clears throat> and you're putting it in, and you want some prediction. And you actually can, if you can predict, compare something about your prediction with some measurement, right? That's the whole point. Then you can do adaptive feedback. And the idea is you do adaptive feedback on that dense layer where you live in this low dimensional latent space, okay? And then you adaptively tune your actual model and you need some kind of prediction to compare it to. It, it shouldn't be, your measurement shouldn't be your actual prediction. If it was, right, you wouldn't need this in the first place. You wouldn't need the surrogate model or whatever this is, diagnostic. But if there's something still that you can just get some idea of how well your prediction is doing in real time, you can apply adaptive feedback to adjust that. So the first thing we just uh, applied it to is we wanted to, add a, I'm showing this picture, but actually it's at high res this uh, ultra fast electron diffraction compact accelerator at Berkeley. We wanted to predict the input beam distribution given some downstream measurements. And I was showing this image because I think that's a common problem for many accelerators. You know, for example, at Lance, this is just our injector section. We have some very sophisticated models that run really quickly in GPUs, but we can't use them to guide our tuning or setup of the accelerator in real time because the initial conditions are unknown and incorrect. And so at high res the idea was if we could build some inverse model that predicts our input beam, then we can actually predict everything about the, the dynamics of the beam throughout the machine. So the approach was we, we measured the beam on the cathode. We actually just measured the laser spot, but it was a small enough spot that we assumed the quantum efficiency is not drifting that much over that small region. And so we did a lot of measurements of what the beam looks like here. Then we stacked all those images together and we did a principal component analysis. And I'm just showing you the first 30 principal components of the initial beam coming into high res. And you could see by component around 15, I mean, they're very pretty, but around 15, right? You get main features and then they're kind of very rough and very fine grained detail. And you can see it numerically too, if you actually then reconstructed your initial images by just using the first 15 principal components, you pretty much got very close to the original ones. So the idea was we just, we want a neural network now that predicts the principal components of our beam. So the idea is it's a sort of generative network where you know our input to the network is actually some measurement of the output beam of the accelerator, which is available. It goes through convolutional layers and it gets down to a dense layer where you're finally just predicting the principal components. So this is sort of the generative side of the neural network, but instead of just making a completely general latent space, you know, generative. We, we knew some of the physics, we knew information, and we knew that we should just map to these principal components because they very nicely represent our beam. And because we actually learned them from the data, they, uh, they're they very much lower dimensional. So with just 15 components, then we predict these principal components, we create the input beam that's associated with that output beam. So it's like a, we're solving an inverse problem. And then for adaptive part, we take that input beam and then we stick it into a model that's been tuned to match the accelerator as closely as possible. And we look at what is the output of that model? You know, the beam simulates it and we compare the output of the model to the measured output of the accelerator. And then we adaptively tune the model because the model's not gonna be perfect and some components could drift. And we adaptively tune these PCA components, which is sort of this middle dense layer of the network until we get this error to go away. So finally, once we're matching the measured output beam by adaptively tuning the model and the input beam, then we say, okay, we think we're matching the input beam pretty well and we can actually track it with time. And so in this sort of setup that I'm showing you, it's a sort of machine learning based inverse physics model where we're taking our measured output distribution and we're somehow creating our input distribution where the generative part, we just, replace it with a sum of principal components. And then we take our measured, our predicted, sorry, predicted input distribution, put it in our physics model, 
compare it to the measurement, and then we adaptively tune both of them until they match. And so here I'm just showing you the best case result and the worst case of from the training data. You know, this was the real input image. This was the prediction of the real input image. And this is the error. And you can see it's very dark because it's pretty much, if you look at the color bar, it's almost, you know, it's predicting very well. And then it gets worse and worse. I just picked the examples. This was like the average error that the network achieved. This was the worst, the best case. This was the worst case, just to show you the variance. But you can see we're getting the overall shape very well. And then finally, we, this was all like synthetic data we generated using the simulations just to train the model. Then we used experimental data where this is the actual input beam. And then this is the CNN's prediction of that input beam based on actual output measurements of, you know, we had an input measurement of the beam experimentally and an output measurement. So we, we fed the network the output, it predicted the input, this is their match. Then we adaptively modified the input using this adaptive feedback and it matched even better. And we could show even that in real time, if we start changing some unknown parameter, right, in the system. So for example, we started moving one quad and we could, and we started changing the input beam. So both the principal components of the input beam and one quad in our system is changing and the model could adaptively track it in real time and keep minimizing and keeping the structural similarity between the images high. And, you know, we could, then we could predict the phase space throughout the beam. And you could even imagine now that with this kind of approach, if you're predicting what your input beam looks like, the actual beam, and if you know what your laser looks like, you can use that to predict the quantum efficiency. And finally, I want to show you another example of actually really tuning this latent space is at high res, another thing we're doing is we take an input beam distribution and we have five parameters of the accelerator itself. They come together in the flat dense layer and we add feedback in that dense layer. And then we have just a general generative model which predicts the XX prime, YY prime and Z and E. And so these are all the predictions and we even predict more of the phase space. And what we assume is that maybe we can have a measurement something like a TCAV of the actual longitudinal phase space. And we have a prediction of longitudinal phase space. And maybe we can compare them and look at the error and then use that as feedback to tune these this. And the way this works actually is when you're training the network initially, you know, you're giving it all the right answers and the inputs. And this is all zeros. You just keep feeding it zero during the training part. So this is just doing nothing, but it has this flexibility now where you can in, you know, this is some, this was a hundred parameter, very low dimensional space representation of both the input parameters of the accelerator itself and the input beam, which is a very large dimensional system. And then we can adaptively tune it directly in that latent space. So here's just an example where we started, this is the beam we wanted, right? This is the longitudinal phase space. This is the beam we started with where both the initial beam and the parameters are different. And these are the errors between them. And we run this extremum seeking, which I talked about earlier, and this is just the first 50 steps. You can see within 50 steps, it very quickly brings the parameters up to certain levels and the cost drops. And then, then as you go even further, it eventually finds its way further down. It can be very noisy and spiky. And eventually, you know, this is the match it found. Or again, now it's actually predicting not just the longitudinal phase space, but the transverse phase space as well. Because our model, when we trained it, it learned all of these relationships actually. We learned it to sort of be consistent. And so it's by just matching, the only feedback it's using here is we're assuming we have a measurement of the longitudinal phase space to adjust this latent low dimensional space of this convolutional generative network. But we're able to match these. And of course, I want to be um, honest, you know, this is just one very good example because you can imagine you, you shouldn't uniquely, you know, you could maybe you can match these, but these, these don't necessarily have to match. I mean, in the limited amount of data we use to train this, it does pretty well anyway, but here's another example where it doesn't do as well. Again, now the, the cost function does go down, but you could see that the X and Y, those phase spaces, which aren't used as the cost function, but it's checking how well it's doing. They are very noisy, everything's very noisy. This is a, very, a bad example, you know, well, it's not working that well, but finally, it did match, you know, it did match the launch of phase spaces really well. 
but it definitely did not match. I mean, they look okay, but if you actually zoom in, this is sort of vertically oriented. This is flattened out. This is completely, you know, there's much bigger difference now between the transverse phase spaces. And that's exactly what you'd expect because if it really only gets to look at the longitudinal phase space, it doesn't have to be unique that it would get these necessarily, but it was sort of a, and here's them side by side, right? You could see it did much better in this case to reproduce the other dimensions and a little bit worse, but but the main idea, I think, we, you know, we're just demonstrating this and we're just starting to play with this. It's in this archive paper. Uh, some of these details are not in the latest version of the archive yet, but I'm gonna put them in pretty soon. And, you know, the idea is you can tune this latent space to really control a large dimensional time varying system without having to tune this really high dimensional input set. And uh, that's all I was gonna say. Do you have any questions?